Good evening and welcome back to the shop here in Canterbury, New Hampshire. We've been excited, waiting for you to get here, and we're glad you showed up and you're going to hang out with us for a little bit tonight here in the shop. Lots been happening. You probably may have seen the new video release from Fine Woodworking on the episode four of the Shaker Dresser project. And the camera lady shipped out all of your drawings today so they're on the way and you've probably already gotten Not no yet. no okay sorry I'm still waiting for the post office to give me the tracking data back so it should be soon tomorrow great so those are on their way and uh you can check those out when you get them once again if you didn't hear me last week we're going to be having a full in-depth course on building that shaker dresser in May, it may early, yeah, around there. <laughs> That's, it coincides roughly with when the article comes out in Fine Woodworking Magazine. It'll be just after that by a little bit, so I'm not sure exactly when they're doing that. But anyway, I'm excited tonight uh, to talk about lap joints. Huh? <laughs> the big stars of joinery are the dovetails, you know, through, exposed, uh, you know, like half blind, sometimes mitered, but they're a little showy, and through tenons. You know, we always think those are the kind of glamour joints. The lap joint is a humble joint. It kind of gets left behind a little bit, but it's a really cool, fun joint to make in furniture, and I'm going to show you some of that right now. But um, before I forget, if you enjoy this content, Go ahead and subscribe and hit that bell because that will make sure that you get every time we post content. And if you want to be on a real insider and get all these special deals like our last one on the Shaker Dresser Drawing, you should be on our mailing list at epicwoodworking.com. Well, anyway, some of you know... That would be great. Excuse me? I said that would be great. Okay. <laughs> some of you know that I am a football fan. I've always loved football my whole life, and we had the big Super Bowl game this past weekend. You know, and all the news about the players and everything, it dawned on me, I never realized how, how much I have in common with Tom Brady. I mean, outside of, <laughs> what? outside of the name, right? But I realized he has three kids, two boys and a girl, he worked really hard to be able to hold one of these, huh? <laughs> and he's married to a supermodel. Oh, there it is. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Oh, my goodness. You get so, anything you want after that. Oh, my gosh. All right. Super it's inside and out. Okay. So tonight, we're going to go on with our our lap joint, but I want to show you some of the applications where we've seen lap joints applied. Um, one of the fun things I've done with the kids, you know, is people ask, have you made a lot of furniture with your kids? And I say, well, I'm a little embarrassed. I haven't made a ton, but when we did make things out here in the shop, the boys usually wanted to make weapons. So we made various kinds of guns, small, uh, quite detailed, some of them and also uh, swords and spears and, gosh, what else? Well, the usual school projects, which I always got a little <laughs> too into. But anyway. Thank God for you. I'll have to say that. You yeah. couldn't do that for us. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the other things. Volcano. There was a big volcano fest every year. Yeah, uh, it just lots of stuff like that. But one of the fun things we made was these... Uh, these swords and I several rounds of making these because they're they're not made you know incredibly durably but this is a cherry sword and I tell you this was just winging it you know coming out going all right let's get a couple pieces of wood because you know when kids are younger there's not that patient level so basically all it consists of is a lap joint right here and I do that before any of the shapes are cut and then you have your basic Excalibur, 
when you're done with it. I mean, look at that fine blade. <laughs> it's incredible. So sharp, too. Watch out. <laughs> but uh, it's really fun to make. And um, I'll mention the dimensions if you want to do one. I, it's not really that. I just kind of figured it out with this. It's about 39 and a quarter long. Right across here is 9 and an eighth, I think. You'd be anywhere. And the stock is 7 eighths thick by 1 and 3 quarter inches wide. Okay? And this handle, hmm, I should have measured that before. Um, yeah, okay. So nine and, nine and seven eighths to the top of the handle here. So it's the long side. All right, enough of that. So that's one. We can put those dimensions later in the description just in yeah. case people would like that. Another fun project I made with Jessica who was like our adopted child for a certain period of time. How many years was she here? Seven years, a period of time. <laughs> wow, it went by fast. But she was a sweetheart, and she, she was is. our- Thank God she yes, still is. Yes, she still is. We just spoke to her. She's a, she was a South Korean exchange student that we hosted in our home, and she was so much fun. Sister and daughterly. Yeah. Very much. And uh, before she went home, she wanted to make something to bring home with her for her parents and whatever. So we, she came out and we worked together. We made these little crosses. And I don't know, she took a half dozen, I guess. And they were really fun to make. And they were really sweet. And hey, Easter's coming up, so maybe you want to do this too, right? I don't know how else you use these. Or you could strike it rich and sell them for big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> kind of blows that whole idea of what's store your treasures in heaven, yes, it's not on earth, right? The humility of the symbol, yeah. Yeah, it kind of blows that whole concept. <laughs> but anyway, they're really fun to make. And um, of course, you could make them for all sizes. If you wanted to make one for your church, this would be a good method too. It's a nice little lap joint right in the middle. See, it's, it goes through here and here. So it's basically a cutout, half the thickness of the material on both sides that fits together and interlocks. It'll make more sense as we go along. Um, on this table base, this was one I made with Terry Moore on the uh, classic woodworking. I think it was episode three. But this consisted of a big, a heavy uh, cross lap joint right in the center on the bottom. This is a large, you know, walnut here, and we had a. We cut it out precisely the same method. I'm going to show you in a little bit. Excuse me. So there's our cross lap. And then the column was uh, tenoned in like that. Now, you know, in thinking about great uh, masters who've employed the uh, lap joint in their work, the, the primary one that comes to my mind is George Nakashima. He was, no, he was in New Hope, Pennsylvania. And he was known for these slab tables before anyone was really doing slab tops. And he never did a river table with epoxy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but he did some just gorgeous, gorgeous tables. Some of his finest were just large slabs like that. And he was famous for putting in. Let me get these... a little closer, hon. It's a little bit shiny there. Sorry. How's that angle? Wow, that's nice. He was famous for putting these contrasting butterflies, but he would very often do a book match, so you'd have this mirror shape, and you can see the larger table here where you have a number of seats around. He made quite a few very large, almost altar, alt, altar, alt, yeah, altar-like tables uh, for churches, and they were called, often they were termed peace tables, and almost always out of great walnut slabs like this. But where he employed the lap joint was on the base. So here's, here's a couple that were more square in shape. He just has a live edge down the side. I actually made a table just like this for a client in New York City years ago that wanted this uh, Fisherman's Cove table. It's a pretty funny old way of the, the Photoshop there. Not the most effective. 
and uh, but it's, it's okay. And then this one has a weird Photoshop mistake right there, where they have a white spot where there should be wood. But regardless, what we've got here is this center rail, and it laps over the cross foot, and then these uprights come down, and they actually uh, go around like a bridle joint over the foot over there. So all that interlocking joinery makes for quite a strong base. Here's another look at a different type of joint. This is pretty sweet. This is looking up under the base of a table, and it starts with the two feet. There's one long one here. We're looking right at the bottom, and then another long one here. And those are lapped together. So there's a cutout of that one and that one. Then it's made even more interesting by the column coming down and having four corners that slip over and actually nest inside. Pretty, pretty interesting joint. I, you know, I'm going to, this would be a fun one to make sometime because it would be a square column, but it would be really nicely done to interlock it. And here's the table that that's employed on right here. So I don't know if you can see that base, but you've got a lap joint and then he tapers the tops of these these uh, legs or feet coming out, and then you have the column coming down with the four corner slipping over, locking the whole thing together. What we want to, what I want to show you tonight, are just simple, straightforward lap joints, like the sword and the cross, and how we go about making them. All right. So, my, I want to just go over first the method, if you should desire to make them by hand. I'm going to show you a table saw method in, in a few minutes, but I just want to show you the method for doing it by hand, if that's what you'd like to do. And, I, and I'll take a couple simple pieces. These are the same dimension as the sword material, and I'm going to just put them across each other like this. All right, so the key to any good joinery is accurate marking out, and then just cut to your line. It's simple. <laughs> simple. <laughs> it's simple. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to take this piece here and I'm going to overlap it in the center here. So, of course, I want this to be square. So I'm going to set a square on here, and I'm going to just hold it like that with the to me, so I know I've got a good square rail right there. I could use a larger square, but a small one will suffice. And now holding it right there, I'm going to I'm going to come over this side, I'll go over here. Okay. I'm going to make a little score mark on this side. I don't want to go too deep. This is a nuanced point, but the the marking knife is flat on the back. That's always the side that you reference off the square material. So it's indexing beautifully right against the flat piece. And the bevel side is away. So the harder I press on this, the flat will still go directly straight down, but the bevel is going to be widening the knife line like a V-cut as I go down. So that if I kept really bearing down, that bevel would make a wider line. Now, so I just want to go that much, and I can clean it up in a second. I'll show you how. So then I'm going to come to the other side without moving, and I'm going to just flip my knife again with the flat side against it and make a light scoring mark. Okay. Now, with that light, now I can make it a little deeper. But this time, I'm going to turn this so the bevel is on the inside. That way, I'm not widening it, and I've got greater accuracy here. So I'm going to set it right in the cut, bring up my square, and there we go. Swing it around, same thing. That's it. Now, I'm going to do the same on this one. 
So I'm not, I would specify a location, but I'm just going to eyeball something here. And again, just go through the same exercise. This time I won't talk so much. Light. Flip. Can you see in there? I think a light shadowing here. That's good. Okay. Get that knife in the line. Bring up your square. Now, I've. This is a fun exercise to work with hand tools, but. In reality, uh, if you have a table saw with a dado cutter, it's much faster, and you usually you'll make several things at one time, but this works fine here. Now, I'm going to carry these lines around. Just going to bring that around a little bit with the, the knife, making sure it, it's around the corner. Same thing here. And now I can make this, oops, I want to do it this way. So again, I'm going to keep the flat side. This time I want the flat side out. So see how clean that is? I don't care if I overshoot it because the, that line should be covered when it interlocks. Everything on the internal area of this joint is covered. So I've got a question from John. Why not pin? the two together first, so both pieces can be scribed. Uh, yeah, you could do that too, John. I, I, um, but I wanted to hold it because I just wanted to set it there for a second, pull it away before I knifed it tightly. But yeah, you could absolutely do that, and then make your light lines, pull it apart, knife them in. But, um, Usually you're in a situation where you've got larger pieces and but that's a definitely that's a good thought. Definitely do that. <laughs> yeah, Mark says the two might be slightly different from one another, you never know. Well, oh I forgot to mention that. Um, when I was prepping this stock, it's helpful especially if you're going to do this on the table saw after, that when you prep your stock, you want to have it very accurately the same. So um, I have found that the best way to do that is by dimensioning it, making sure you're good and square, and I run it through the drum sander. Um, what's that one called again? Oh, Supermax. I got one of those Supermax drum sanders. It's nice. It's like, it does a good, smooth job, and you don't have as much sanding. But the key thing is, when you feel them next to each other, they're really accurate. I've, I've done this a lot, though, also off of um, a joiner um, or the thickness planer. But you'd be prepping them by hand and making sure they're the same thickness. Because obviously, when they interlock, they need to be the same thickness so that when they seat fully, it's flush on both sides. So that would have to agree that way. OK, so I've got all this marked. Now, the only thing I haven't marked is the depth. And I want the depth to be half the thickness on, into each piece. So I'm going to just use, I've already set this square, I'm sorry, this marking gauge to 7 16 because this is 7 8 Let me see if that looks about right. Yeah. That's about right. So I'm going to just go ahead and score that across. I'd be a little more careful about nor, not uh, overshooting the lines, but I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to try to do this to perfection because I want to get on to the other. But this is actually the process. Okay. Now I've got beautiful knife lines showing me my depth. And the last thing I want to do here is mark what's coming away. So that's coming out, that's coming out, and then the same here. 
So if I did this right, these two will come together and they will interlock beautifully together. All right, so now comes the fun part. We get to do a little hand sawing and I get to try a saw I haven't used in a while. Let me put my, uh, my victory trophy over here. <laughs> and Still a winner. What? And I'm going to swing this out so you can see. I think I'll just put it in the vise here rather than putting it in, a clamping it to the bench. I want to get it pretty horizontal. And there we go. Now, let's see, do I need my light? It might help my little funky light. Hopefully this doesn't screw up your... What, is this going to mess you up? Does that mess you up? No, I, I'll just change my position. Okay. Unbelievable. All right, so I'm going to make a cut. I'm going to make several cuts down the middle. So actually, that's a good time to practice. I actually haven't yet a lot of experience with this particular. It's kind of shining a little light under the camera. Sorry. <laughs> I haven't had an experience with this saw. It's a long cross cut, 14 uh, points per inch. A Lee Nielsen that the camera lady gave me as a nice gift when we were doing an event there. <laughs> we, we basically spent all our profits, right? Did we? Well, it was an investment back in the day. It was an investment. It's not like we went out to dinner. No, exactly. It was awesome. It was so like here that. it is. But I, you know, um, it looks great in the tool cabinet, but I don't use it as much as my dovetail saw. It's a beauty. So I'm going to get used to it a little bit. I'm going to make those internal waist cuts first, just to get a hang of it. Usually I make the other side. Oh, it cuts beautifully. I'm going to go right down to the line. I want to just practice cutting true and plumb. Sometimes you'll find that you tend to drift one way or the other. Some of you just drift. I, I just drift. <laughs> In general. Okay, so that feels good. Now I'm going to go to the knife line. Now, when I make this cut, I want to see the teeth just touch the knife line. It's not quite as... I'm on the other side of you now, so you just have to trust me that I'm doing that. See, my start is just on the inside, the waist side of the knife line. Here we go. It's tough to see with the shadows, but. I'm gonna feel my way along. Okay, right down there. Now I'm gonna hit the other one. This one you can see, I think. Okay, just touch that knife line. Now, you could cut shy of the knife line and drive a chisel down through it, but where would the fun be in that? It's just what I was thinking. <laughs> So before going to the next one, rather than repositioning the piece, I'm going to knock out some of that waste. So here we go. See, the multiple cuts make that easier to pop out. I'm come back to this side. I don't want it to split out too deeply. But you know what? This is a very forgiving joint because when everything comes together, this is all concealed anyway. So I want to go right to my knife line. And you know, at this point, sometimes on larger joints, I've set up a plunge router to that exact half depth and skimmed around there. So then the floor was nice and parallel. You knew it was parallel with the surface and then just clean up in the corners. I'm not gonna bother right now. I just want to clean this out kind of quickly, and we'll see how it fits. Just want to get this cleaned out in the corner. So here we go. I'm going to set the chisel right in the knife line now. 
after I've removed almost all the material. If you do it too early, you're going to force the chisel down. So we want to just, just wiggle it because you're going across the grain and it cuts pretty easily. Okay, I'll turn it around. should have more control. Usually my hand, I'm pinching it right up there. But since I have it in the vise, I'm not in as, I can't get my hand that close to the workpiece. But no, no problem. All right, so that's good. Um, I'm not going to fuss with it anymore, but we're about half the way there. Now let's go ahead. And this is just a review, basically, of the same thing. I'm going to Lock it in nice and parallel, and make my prep, my cuts. I'll do the same thing. We need a speed ahead button. Why? Why? Oh, okay. <laughs> this is a good time to go to the bathroom, but actually, <laughs> you better make it quick because. Intermission. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to make this cut. While you're doing that, I've got a again. question from Evan, Tom. Okay, Evan. What about using a router plane? Uh, yeah, Evan, that's also a good way of doing it. Um, this being such a narrow piece, it's uh, not as advantageous. Router planes work better when there's a wider footing, but yes, you could. I'll show you all what he means. Good point, Evan. Evan. Evan, I said. Oh, I said Aaron, sorry. <laughs> All right, I'm going to just saw down. I don't use my router plane enough. I, I got a, someone gave me a nice gift of a Lee Nielsen a while ago. My neighbor, when I helped him move, he left to Florida. I need to give you a different picture. Okay. All asleep. All right, here we go. So I'm trying again just to make my cuts right up to the knife line. And here we go. I'm going to waste this out. This will make you appreciate the table saw method. That's why it's always good to do some by hand. And, you know, it's nice to have the hand skills when you need it. There's a lot of times when you just want a small joint, like in, in uh, furniture making. That's your crosscut saw, correct, Tom? Not yeah. your dovetail saw, right? Yeah, that's yeah. the crosscut. Yeah. That's why I haven't used it as much. I use the dovetail a lot. But, uh, and that's a larger saw, but it's really nice. You could see. Um, it's tough with the light here. All right, so I'm not gonna clean this up quite to the full depth. I'm not. Well, I'm. I think it might be pretty close, but. Just want to make here. sure. What's that? I'm get, just trying get, to give a little variation of view. The wide shot. <laughs> Okay, and now I'll spin it around, and we'll get the inside. Mark said it's going so fast with the hand tools, he wouldn't have his dado set up yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if you're going to make a few, Mark, you definitely, like I'm going to, like I, when I was making swords, I would make two or three at least at a time. So you had someone to fight with and poke their eye out. Our boys now have the image of those swords on their forearms. Yeah, that's right. As a, um, they got the tattoos. Memory. 
tattooed on there. They're only, they're only about that big, right? It's not a weapon idea. I, I don't feel it's a memory thing. Right, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a weapon. No, it's not a weapon. It's a memory. <laughs> don't ruin my, my idea. Okay, so that's good. I'm not going to fuss anymore. Oh, let me show you the... Oh, David and Joe are asking if you ever use a Japanese cross saw. Uh, so. So yeah, I could use this right here, but I'm not going to set it up right now. But this is the method. So you've got a little tooth there, and this was the old method of of wasting and cleaning up the floor of for depth and coming across in both ways. The and router plane. Yeah, what it does is it controls the depth of cut. So by dialing this up and down, I got to loosen that. I could dial it up or down to the half the depth. And then once you've got it almost, just almost to the line, then it can just take that last bit and you come from the outside in and you basically do what the step I was just doing right at the end there. Yeah, so, so the question was, do you ever use a Japanese saw for the finer cuts? <clears throat> um, once in a while, I... I went through a period where I used it a lot, and then went back. I broke some teeth on it, and uh, then I got I got the Lee Nielsen one, and I pretty much use that all the time for primarily dovetailing. So, all right, so that's the joint, and let's move on. Okay. I guess we should test the fit first, <laughs> didn't we? I don't know. Let's see how this works. So the way you can tell, I'm going to use the back first to see if this one fits. Hey, how about that? Nice press fit. So I know that'll fit. Now I can try this one. That fits nice too. Woo, got lucky. Now let's try them together. This is a little more difficult because they both have to you just kind of wiggle it together. Look at that. Man, that actually came out pretty nice. Nice. Nice press fit. And boy, it feels flush. No smoke or mirrors. No. Nope. Not like the usual. <laughs> Stick around. Something will... So, so you glue that up, and you've got a really nice joint. Now, it's not technically a mechanically fitting joint, like a... A dovetail goes together, and that's interlocked in a way that it doesn't want to come apart. It doesn't take much glue. It can only come apart one way. This um, can break because you've, you basically have weakened it by half the thickness, but it's a pretty darn effective joint that's not going to take a lot of stress. It's great at the bottom of a table like we did with the Terry Moore table. So that's the hand cut method. If you want to go ahead and make one like that. Now let's show, I want to show you the table saw method and we can, I'm going to actually prep these swords, at least one of them, and um, I've got some cross material as well. It's all been nicely dimensioned and I'll see if I can pop a couple together. I'm not sure what we'll do with those, but if you've got any ideas, let me know. All right, so let me... Uh, Head on over to the table saw. Okay, I'll follow you. All right, so I went ahead and got a dado stack in the saw. And a dado stack, if you're not familiar, it, it just takes, you go from the regular saw blade to stacking a number of saw blades together to widen the cut or the kerf of the cut. So here's a dado set. This one's by Freud, eight inch super dado. And you have, you always get like two outside blades. So those have to be positioned with the writing out so that you have your left and your right. And that's the minimum. And with the minimum, you got a quarter inch. So it's basically twice the thickness 
of your standard carbide blade, which is an eighth. Now you can stack as many filler pieces between them, and you, you get like four of them that are an eighth inch. And after you put all of those together, four inside, you get three quarters of an inch thick. So then you can adjust for thickness with these micro shims, which usually get a pack in there, these micro shims. And then they also give you a couple extra insert pieces that aren't the eighth inch. So I think one's like a 32nd or a 16th, and the other one might be 3 seconds or something. When do you need to find some point between that? Because you know how, how plywood isn't exactly three quarters of an inch. So these shims are helpful, but what I did was to set up my stack, I wanted to figure out how, what the thickness was of my cross material so I could make the dado through there. And it's right about three quarters of an inch. I'll talk more about that in a minute because I want to do the, the sword first. So let me set this aside. Um, Joe's asking if you use a kerf maker. A kerf maker. Whoops. I'm not sure what you mean. Okay. If you can describe that. Um, we'll is, that an a, is that a, a brand name? I don't know. He, I think this is Joe from Portugal, right, Joe? Oh, I'm not sure what that is. Maybe we're... If I remember right, maybe I'm... All right, so let's go ahead and we'll, oh, I got to get my, um, I'm going to use the marking gauge to mark the thickness of my stock here. Okay, so I'll go ahead and mark across like that. And to figure this out, let's see if I got that scrap still. Yeah, I'll use this piece. They're saying that the kerf maker is a device. Oh. <laughs> that little device. Okay. I don't know. That clears things up. <laughs> Can you guys? All right. So I'm going to use one of these as a test. So this is the thickness, and we want to get half the thickness of that. So I'll go ahead and make my mark here because we've got to set the blade height, which I haven't done yet. But also, we're going to, we want to get the, um, the amount of shim, the type of shim I need. So I'm going to set this up. Let's see. I'll do the, here we go. I'm going to use the handle first. Okay. So I'm going to set this up. That's my curve. I'm cutting right there with my blade. So I'll put my line right there, and I'm going to set a stop on this end. Bring that stop in, hit it. And lock it in. Okay, so I've got the stop set on the far side, so I'm going to make one pass, and that's not wide enough of a curve for this, I'm about an inch and a quarter, so I know I'm about a, I need another half inch to move over. But let's go ahead and make that cut, and then I'll show you what we'll do. This is the thing about a dado stack. It's got a lot of mass to it, so it takes longer to slow down <laughs> and get quiet. But that's okay. 
because we get time, right? Is anybody in a hurry? Um, so anyway, here's my test cut. And if you check this out, if I, this is the width of my stock. If I just bump it inside that edge, and then I come to the other side, I'm going to make a knife line over here. Now I, have, I want to shim this piece over this distance. So I hit that knife line. So let's just see. If I measure it, bang, it looks exactly a half an inch. So I happen to have this, this cross stock is a half an inch. So if I put that in there, that looks almost perfect. It's just a little shy of the line, so that'll be perfect. I'll use one of these, and I'm just going to shim it till it moves enough so this press fits in. All right, so. That was convenient. Yeah, what do you know? <laughs> so they're saying that Woodpecker makes one of these kerf makers. OK. And you set the device gap to the thickness of the wood and match the data set to the gap. Oh, the yes. To I, it. I did just see that. That's pretty clever. I saw that uh, advertised. That's a new thing. Thanks for explaining that for us, Rick. I think if you're doing a lot of uh, plywood stock, that's pretty worth it. You know, if you were doing a lot of dados, like with plywood sheet goods and all that. I, I don't do a heck of a lot like that. I'm making a lot of furniture with mortise and tens and whatever details, but Thanks, that Joe, should be something, yeah. I may have to see if woodpeckers would like to share one of those <laughs> with me so I could show you guys, of course. <laughs> Bridge All City right. Tools makes one too, they said. Sweet. Um, Tom, do you need to, to worry, Evan's asking about wood movement in the lap joint? Um, yeah, if, you, if it's really wide, you do. But, and if it's plain sawn, and it's a, a wood species that moves quite a lot. I was actually thinking about that when I was showing you the walnut table. I hadn't looked closely at that base. That base, if I remember right, is about four to four and a half inches. I think it's a four inch. Yeah. And um, so you've got four inch wide material cross lapped. So it's moving across the grain direction, across it but it's not moving at the length. So with that cross lap, it's fixed in one direction and it might want to move in the other way. And I looked at it and it's tight as it was when we set it up. So that's not true in all cases. You got to definitely make sure you're working with dry material. I suppose if you built it in the humidity of the summer and fit it nicely tight, there's a chance that in the dry heat, like around here right now in the dead of winter, it would shrink and you'd see a little gap there. But that's a good question. That's something you're always thinking about with furniture making. So with, uh, but I haven't seen it be an issue there. Only really when you're getting, I think, much wider than four to five inches. You'd have to think more. And then if you use quarter sawn, you would be safer to have less movement. OK. So here we go. We've got it set up. We've got our thing. Now I've got to adjust the height. Let's go ahead and get that. Here it is. So I'm using scrap to get the height and uh, get my safety gear on because I'm always safe. <laughs> Here we go.
Okay, I'm gonna put this in. My tapping spacer. Not quite. I'm gonna add a piece of tape. Okay, so, so what we did there was on my test piece, I made the first cut, then I moved it over about a half an inch, and it was still a little snug, so by putting that piece of tape on there, it moved it over four thousandths of an inch. That's how thick that, that manila tape is. And there we go, we had a nice snug fit. Now, I'd rather be a little snug because I could just lightly sand this. Sometimes I'll hand plane it if it's a little tighter. But you can change the dimension a little bit by just lightly sanding and get a beautiful press fit. It's easier to do that once you're really close than have it be loose because then you're going to certainly have a gap. All right, so I've got that one. This is my test fit. Now, all I have to do is cut the opening here and I got my center mark so I'm gonna set my pencil line there and then it'll get bumped over by the um, the shim after the cut so here we go I'll set it here I'm gonna move my stop in and isn't this this is like quick work once you get this set up you can see why you want to make a few of them but man it's so crisp and gives you a beautiful joint with both, with everything dimension the same. There we are. So I've got that one. And on, this is my other half. Here we go. Gonna make these cuts, see how it fits. Okay. Yes, it's the same set. Okay, I just asked Tom if the if the dado set that was in the saw is the same as the Freud ones that he showed us earlier. Yeah, I have two sets. Um, so. So we'll put a. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't do the links yet, but I'll put that in the description. Okay. Um, I'm not sure who else makes them these days, but. Uh, they're they're actually talking some about. That, well, not the dado stuff, but the curve maker. Oh, okay. So here we go. We've got our blades and what is this called? The hilt? I forget. Um, I don't know. But this is the joint. So let's see 
I'm going to test the back just like I did. Okay, that's nice and snug. But this is where you, if it's a little too snug, you can just come in here and just, I mean that, just do that. It doesn't take much. And then I'll do the same on this one because I know they're the same. And here we go. Let's see how it goes. Mark's asking, is that an extra zero clearance bed on top of the sled? Ah, uh, yes, Mark. I um, set that up earlier. I, you know, this has a wide cut in it, and I'm always putting sacrificial pieces over the original until I destroy the jig so to the point where it's time to make a new one. So I was just a little more light sanding. You gotta have a good block. We don't want to round anything over. We want that joint to be snug. So um, Sue's asking, is the process much different if your laps are to be cut at the ends of your boards, like a four frame? Um, yeah, that would be called an end lap, Sue. Um, and it's not much different. I mean, you would do this, you could use the same dado stack method. You also can use, when you're in that case, you can go vertically and use the tenoning jig to cut each side of the lap because you're open on the end. So you certainly can use this method as well, same, same method. So check this out. Now that you got it lightly sanded, you put it together, you gotta get it lined up right, and then this thing, look, it just it presses together so smoothly, and there we have it. Get out of my way. But this is very primitive, right? You're not quite lightsaber. You're not quite Conan the Barbarian yet. <laughs> You've got a little more uh, shaping to do. Where you're going to do that? And I just kind of fudged that. But that was kind of fun to do. And then we, on the bandsaw, cut the angles and then cleaned it up with a spoke shave and brought it to a point. But um, I'm not going to mess with this other one. I'll just show you real quickly. The crosses. Now, the way the cross ended up, I don't need to shim it at all. The, it ended up that the actual uh, blade with the, all of the, the fittings in there to make it three quarters of an inch is perfect. At first, I checked it, you know, the thickness of this material, and it was slightly, it's slightly less than, let's see, yeah, it's slightly less than. Um, the three quarters of an inch. So I thought I might have to. Uh, yeah. But anyway, long story. Let me just go ahead and run one through there, and we'll go now. I, I made. I got Wenge for this because um, it's so sweet. This this was one of the original crosses we made, and no finish on it. It just had a really nice look, and we broke the edges lightly. So it's softer. And I used the Wenge. I made sure I, I had the grain oriented so we were more plain sawn. Or we had those wider bands of figure on the face. Notice the edges have really thin lines. That's the quarter sawn area. So if we look at the end grain of this top, you can see the grain running right across. So it's perpendicular to this surface here which makes it quarter sawn on that face and plain sawn on the front. So I like that because it gives you this kind of wild, much more interesting surface. If you prefer the linear, then go with this angle when you prep your stock. You want your wider to have the quarter sawn grain. All right, so let me just set this. All we got to do is get the depth set. Here, I've got a little. Looks rugged. The old rugged cross is always trying to Rugged cross. Say. That wood makes it look rugged. <laughs> cool. I like it. The camera lady scores with a pun. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Uh, a, a very, uh, so it shows you how worldly I am. <laughs> the old church background coming out. All right, so I'm going to set that about the right height. Again, I would do a test here. I'm not going to fuss with it too much. I'm going to go ahead. Now this is 
Um, I got the center marked already, so I won't have to mess around. And I can see the knife line right there. So this is centered. I'm going to bring up my stop. There we go. Now, the way I designed this little cross, it's three and a half by five and a half. So pretty simple, five and a half by three and a half. And then the, the uh, cross lap is right in the center of this cross piece, right in the center. And the length from here out and here out is the same as here. So we're going to use the exact same stop off of this end and off of the top. And you'll end up with a nice um, equal setting there. And the, it'll work out really nicely. Okay? And you have a safe way to do that, I'm sure. What do you mean? <laughs> Seems your fingers are going to be very close to that blade. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to put them on the blade. No worries. <clears throat> Oops, the camera went dark. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is where you can play around and see how you like the grain. I guess it's going to be the same either way, but I like usually having the cathedral like that if it's going to be pointing up. So that'll be the top of the cross, and then... This one, it really doesn't matter. So let's go ahead and see how this works. Um, I'm going to do one quick test before I run these through. And I'm not going to stop the saw, and then I'll run these through to check the depth on uh, using some of this other scrap. I'm not sure I got the height quite right. All right, here we go. Okay, so we can see by flipping it to the back that it fits together nicely there and nicely there. It's beautiful. And then we can get a little piece off there. Just put it together and press fit it together. I gotta change the depth just a touch. But there you have it. Pretty sweet, huh? Little cross, just like our original. So I'll get that depth set a little bit, just a slight bit more, run it again, it'll be perfect because I'm not going to move that stop. Look at I got all these pieces over here. I got enough to make 13 or 14 of them. <laughs> See when I was prepping the stock it's so little that you needed a longer stick so why not. 
make a few extra. Come on back over to the bench, and we'll wrap it up for the night. I wanted to show you one other thing over here. And one of these days I'm going to prep this, but check this out. This is a beautiful ceramic tile made by Rob Russell. He's, uh, you remember him? He I took don't. one of the earliest classes when I was teaching at the Shaker Village. I think it was 90, 1999. 2000. So he was a, a ceramic artist and he just loved woodworking too and so he took some classes with me and he came by and dropped this off to me in this is 2009. So but he makes these beautiful ceramic things where he impresses uh, different kind of uh, plants in there and dragonflies, these little swirlies and then he glazes them and gets color in there. Really beautiful panels. So anyway, I thought I'd take this and actually make a frame for it and have the corners lap like that. So I'm going to lap them over like that. So it's a little more, rather than just your picture frame, they'll extend beyond the corners a little bit like that, sort of. Is that making sense? So. And then it'll be recessed into the back. And I'll probably give this wenge a little texturing because you can put it on a wire brush wheel on a grinder. And it will take away those lighter colored bands and create a beautiful texture. That's one of the nice features of it. These little crosses seem like they're nice enough with just the lively um, figure there. But so one of these days. I'll share that with you, but that's a good use of a cross lab joint, but that one's going to be out on the corner of the piece rather than the standard miter. Are there any other questions? No more questions. Are we going to, you going to share about next week? Oh, yes. Next week's going to be a blast. I've got a uh, Monday night is a private class we're doing with the What's the name? New Jersey? New Jersey Woodworkers Association. You have to be a member to participate in that. So yes. if you live in New Jersey and you're not a part of that, uh, I don't know if it's a guild or association, you yeah, reach out like to them. Yeah, it's like a guild. Yeah, um, New Jersey the Woodworkers WA. Association. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you find them online. Yep. And we're going to do a little thing on beginning wood turning. So if you're interested in that and you're in that area, go for it. It'll yeah. be fun. And uh, so We've done this with them before. This is yep. our second one with them. And then on Thursday night, our usual shop night live time, we're actually going to have a special presentation with Fine Woodworking Magazine. I'm doing their, what do they call those? Their webinar. Um, that's what they've been terming it with us. Yeah, they have monthly webinars, and they happen to fall on Thursday night, but not at 8 o'clock, at 7 o'clock. So if you show up at 8, you missed it. <laughs> and it's not exactly the same uh, feed, right? It's going to go through their... We're waiting to hear from them how they want to do it. Yeah. So as you see the sign-up option come up on their social media, if you want to be a part of that, it's free. You don't have to charge, but it does go through, it will go as far as we know through their system. Right. Uh, so you've seen them. If you're f familiar with woodworking, fine woodworking, they do this, as Tom said, monthly. So Tom is doing a presentation. Can you tell them why Yes, I'm, I'm going to oh, do that. You are. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to describe it. No, you do it much better. Oh, so. thanks. So it's going to be about shellac. Now, I've talked about shellac here, but I haven't gone like full-blown in-depth. Some, If you've been uh, hanging out here a while, you're going to, it'll be somewhat review here and there. But I've got some nice shellac to show. I'm going to talk about all the virtues of and uses and types and applications and uh, ways of generally how nice a finish it can be and how useful it can be in many situations. So I hope you tune in for that. Let's, let's blow out the fine woodworking feed. They, they don't know what's about to hit them. So uh, by yeah. all showing up. If right? you are on our mailing list, we will send out a link 
And if you're interested in getting this link, make sure you sign up for our mailing list. That's not the same as subscribing to YouTube. Right. There's a link in the description to sign up, and we will send out information on how to not miss this. Right. Event. That's epicwoodworking.com. It's easy to sign up right there, and um, you'll get the information that you need. So you can also look at the plans if you ha if you weren't aware of that. We just uh, we've got the shaker dresser plans up there, and lots of other project plans that are awesome for especially this time of year and quite a few of them have a video component as well that'll walk you through a lot like we did tonight but through the actual build of a piece of furniture so you can see exactly what you're going to make you'd have full-size drawings and the reassurance that you can revisit that video anytime you want so it's pretty handy and it's a great way of learning in my book because I'm one of those people who needs to see things and maybe you are too if you're into this visual art. So anyway, that's what's happening next week. We won't see you on Shop Night Live, but we'll see you on the Fine Woodworking webinar, which will be a lot like it. It's going to be about the same length. I think it goes between an hour and an hour and a half. So it'll be a, a good full hour presentation, follow up with questions. So we can, uh, we can crash their site by Right by such an overwhelming response. But um, thank you all, too, for those comments you're leaving on the Fine Woodworking uh, video series, The Shaker Dresser. If you haven't seen any of those, you can go to Fine Woodworking's YouTube page. Just check that out, search for that, and up you'll see those videos. There's four of them now on The Shaker Dresser. And I noticed some of you uh, from here leaving really nice comments over there, and that that's awesome. That really uh, is a good feeling all around. <laughs> so yes. thanks for doing that. But um, well, I think Tom Brady's had enough for tonight. <laughs> I've got my trophy over there. <laughs> but I really appreciate you all hanging out with us. And remember, if you like this content, go ahead and subscribe and ring that bell so you're notified of all the nice stuff we've got coming up and every time we post a video. So once again, for the camera lady and myself, thanks for being here. We look forward to seeing you next week, not on Shop Night Live, but on the Fine Woodworking webinar. So we'll see you then at 7 p.m. on Thursday night. We'll send you the link if you're on our mailing list. See you all later. Thanks for hanging out with us. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.